Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fies from Central New Mexico Community College. In this video L, we are finally going to start our discussion on gas exchange. Gas exchange can be divided up into external and internal respiration. External respiration refers to the gas exchange between alveoli and capillaries. So here we see a big red blood cell in a capillary lined with endothelium, and in the purple we see our alveolus lined with its um, simple squamous epithelium. It's not the most accurate thing to say that external respiration occurs in the lungs only. I really should specify more and say that it's the gas exchange that occurs between, an al between the alveoli and the capillaries. Remember that our lungs have tissues that also need to be nourished, so we're going to see the kind of gas exchange that occurs in some areas of the lungs to be the same uh, kind of gas exchange that we see in the tissues. Notice the direction of the gas exchange between the alveolus and the blood capillaries. We see that carbon dioxide is going to move from the blood into the alveoli. And so the air that we exhale tends to be richer in carbon, carbon dioxide, while the fresh oxygen that is in the alveoli will now diffuse into our blood. Of course, when we learn about gas transport, we will learn about all these details that you're seeing inside of this red blood cell. And so the gas exchange that we see in all of the tissues, except for between capillaries and alveoli, is going to be referred to as internal respiration. And of course, in the case of internal respiration, we see that the gas exchange is opposite from what we saw in external respiration. This time, carbon dioxide is going to be picked up by the blood, and the blood is going to deliver oxygen to the tissues. For us to understand how gas exchange occurs, either at the level of the lungs or in the tissues, we need to learn about a few more laws. And so first we're going to talk about Dalton's law of partial pressure, which is pretty easy. Because it says that if we have a mixture of air, let's say we have our air mixture, meaning the atmospheric air. All of you know that the atmospheric air is made up of different gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen even, and water vapor. So let's say four major gases that together form our mixture called the atmospheric air. Well, each one of these gases has a particular pressure. Oxygen has its own pressure, uh, carbon dioxide has its own pressure, etc. Those individual pressures we call partial pressures. So we talk about the partial pressure of oxygen, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, etc., etc. When we're looking at a mixture of air, like the uh, atmospheric air, its total pressure is the sum of the individual pressures of your gases, or better, the sum of the partial pressures of the gases that make up the mixture. That's pretty much what this whole slide is trying to show you. Here we see um, the partial pressure of oxygen. Here we see, for instance, the partial pressure of nitrogen. And if we look at a mixture made up of oxygen and nitrogen, it is really just the sum of these two gases. But another very important thing to mention is that the partial pressure of each gas is directly proportional to its percentage in the mixture. So what do we mean by that? To explain this, I'm going to use atmospheric air as our example of our gas mixture. And the atmospheric air is made up of oxygen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and nitrogen. Now, any gas mixture will always be made up of the same 
percentage of the individual gases. So for instance, when we look at the atmospheric gas mixture, we're going to see that oxygen always makes up about 21% and almost 0% of carbon dioxide, about a half a percent of water, and almost 80% of nitrogen. Now, if we look at sea level, then the total pressure of our gas mixture is, as you know by now, 760 millimeters of mercury. So of our gas mixture. And if we take a look at the individual pressures of each gas, so remember this PO2 refers to the partial pressure, then we see it's about 100 and 60 for oxygen, almost zero for carbon dioxide, almost four for water, and almost 600 millimeters of mercury for nitrogen. But these numbers reflect these percentages. So where are we going with this? So at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 760. But if we go to a higher elevation, then we're going to see that the atmospheric pressure is going to drop. So our P atmosphere will be less than 760 millimeters of mercury. Maybe we could put it at 740 millimeters of mercury. Well, the percentages of your gases in this mixture that now only has a total pressure of 740 will still be the same as the ones that I have listed here below. So if gas, if the partial pressure for oxygen is about 21%, then in order for you to calculate the exact partial pressure for oxygen at an elevation of 740 would be for you to multiply this by 0.21. So almost a fifth of that, which is about 150. So now we are, and I'm just sort of doing this quickly in my head, so we're at approximately 150 when our total pressure for the atmosphere is down to 740. So all these numbers, all these partial pressures are now going to come down despite the fact that their percentages remain the same. And the same principle applies to when we go below sea level. Now, some interesting things happen when we go below sea level, which is why uh, scuba divers must become certified. They have to have a very good understanding of how much the atmospheric pressure changes when we go below sea level. So when we go just 33 feet below sea level, which is about 10 meters, then we're going to see an increase in atmospheric pressure by what we call one atmosphere. And one atmosphere is a unit that is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. So what this means is that when we go below sea level by 66 feet, let's say, if we drop 20 meters or about 66 feet, then the pressure now has increased from 760 to about 5, 1,520 millimeters of mercury. Sometimes patients are placed in what we call hyperbaric chambers where patients are literally exposed to pure oxygen, so a very high level of, of uh, oxygen pressure. And this is a way for patients to be healed from severe infections, perhaps with bacteria that cannot thrive very well in an oxygen-rich environment, to heal severe burns. The extra oxygen might help heal these um, wounds etc. Or, or even in the case of um, severe carbon monoxide poisoning, 
um, hyperbaric chambers can be, can be very useful. So this wraps up our discussion of Dalton's Law, which discusses the importance of partial pressures in gas mixtures. We're next going to take a look at Henry's Law.